yourself another episode of the vlog. I'm fucking exhausted today. It is Friday morning, check-in day, but Christian is away on holiday, so that means it's not official check-in day because I'm not going to be checking in today, but I will check in with you guys. So we are now around about 160 to 163 pounds. I'm 163 this morning because I haven't had shit this, this death last couple of days. 160 earlier in the week, which means we are down a total of fucking 10 kilos. 11 kilos since the start or, or post uh, operatively, which is a lot, a lot of kilos. Um, from the pictures, you're gonna be able to see here, we are down some significant levels of fat, but also I think there is some muscle yet to come back from, from the training. We're back to training now three times a week. With one leg day, so it's four sessions overall. I'll be ramping that up this week when it comes to uh, training, because I need to do more rehab, I need to do a lot more for the leg, because um, I've been told that the rehab needs to increase now, because it's been a bit more laissez-faire recently, and now it needs to be a little bit more. So the 10 kilos down, and we're back into training in the last two weeks. Over the four weeks that I was part of the rehab before that, I maybe trained twice or three times, I didn't do very much. Uh, I was too scared to go to the gym and do stuff, so I needed that rest and recuperation. But we're now on that upward trend, getting back to where we were before. So it's all systems go effectively for this diet. Calories got dropped last week, so during the, the rehab or during the post-operative period, I was on like 2,000 calories a day, uh, which was significantly less than where I was before. During the building phase, I was 82 kilos, uh, I, um, just before, just before the, the rehab, just before the post-op. Just before the op, I was around about three and a half thousand, I was on six, seven hundred grams of carbs a day, and now we're down to 2,000 calories, which is you know, not that much compared to what it was before. It's been dropped again last week, so it's 1,900 on training days, 1,750 on non-training days. I'm definitely starting to feel the hunger, definitely starting to feel the dietary effects from it, um, which means that I have to be a lot more mindful of my food intake. So beforehand, when I was on 2,000, and definitely before, uh, you know, during the building phase with the you know, consistency of four to five meals in, when I was at the 2,000, when I was post-op at home, I was eating maybe two to three meals because hunger was significantly less. You know, I was eating stuff like, Cereal and uh, cereal and whey, uh, protein. I was eating chicken and, and bread. I was eating like you know, very much similar patterns between those two meals consistently, just day in day out. But because of the food now getting getting lower, I have to be a lot more tactical with my food intake. So you know, my food intake at the moment is like egg white omelet with with two pieces two pieces of bread. You got chicken veggies. Uh, you've got probably a, a cereal and protein meal. And, um, and maybe a little snack as well. I'm trying to eat cream of rice as well because obviously the, um, the volume of cream of rice is significantly higher than anything else like cereals. So I'm trying to get a lot more high voluminous foods in there to help me withstand this hunger because uh, it's starting to build and I'm like, fuck, I remember this from dieting, it sucks. So um, that's been this week for sure. So definitely feeling leaner, definitely looking leaner. Uh, wait and trying to get and starting to get that pop back from a physique perspective when I do go to the gym the vascularity is out the veins are out uh, which is awesome it just, uh, it's just it's going to take a little bit of time to come back in terms of supplements and gear usage uh, supplements wise like painkillers were down from tramadol three times a day all the way down to just maybe paracetamol twice a day and uh, taking some anti-inflammatories on, on a regular basis uh, naproxen and meprazole uh, with anti-inflammatories, they are so fucking destructive of your gut that you just have to be super protective of, of the other formats that you have as well. So, for example, like me, you have to eat when you when you take them so that the patterns down the digestive system as, you, as, you, as they, those medications go through. And meprazole, which is uh, not even an anti-inflammatory, you have to take with naproxen to make sure that it doesn't cause any gut ripping or any issues in terms of that. So you have to take one medication for the anti-inflammatories and one medication for the anti-inflammatory not to fuck you up, which is... That there's a good lesson in medication that is just uh, you, you do for one thing and you have to take another thing for another thing that that causes the ramification for and over time if you were to get older and take loads of other stuff you take a medication for that then take a medication to stop that other thing having a ramification then take another thing to stop that having another ramification you end up taking 10 medications on a day-to-day -day basis just because you've got two ailments or one ailment which is just fucking crazy so we're on anti-inflammatory twice a day in um, and a meprazole to, to withstand that paracetamol and uh, from and that's really it. I'm still taking melatonin before bed because I still can't sleep very well. As you can probably see, I'm fucking tired today. I've been up all night because of my knee's been hurting. So uh, the back of the knee's been really, really hurting and paining. So I've been up sleeping on the sofa for an hour, getting up, going back to bed for a bit, coming back out, going back to bed. It's just been uh, it's been that, the story of the last six weeks to be honest. So uh, I'm taking melatonin before bed, two caps to try and knock me out as best as possible, but still not exactly there doesn't give me the most 
uh, sleep possible. From a gear perspective, we pushed down gear from the push, which was at like 600 mils, or a mil milligrams of Primo, three mil of, um, of test, uh, metformin and uh, myocardis, which is um, a blood pressure medication. During the post-operative stage, we just pull everything back to literally just, um, just 150, 200 mg of, of test, going a bit of a TRT dose or, or a little bit more, but like just, uh, just low as it can go, just to kind of keep that muscle tissue and not go into a, a you know, non-super physiological dose. And then as the last week got clearance to go back to the gym, had a week's worth of training, and then basically we're back up to a, to a higher dose, so 200 mil, uh, meg of, uh, of Primo, uh, 300 meg of Test, and then uh, growth hormones been added in, obviously from the healing process from a knee perspective, which is awesome. So that's been added in uh, to uh, give us uh, the healing properties as well as the benefits that, that growth hormone does. Um, and that will slowly increase as the next couple of weeks go by uh, and we get really back into training which is going to be exciting that will obviously change my physique that will change the way it looks that will change the pop it will change uh, the dynamics so very excited to get back to some bigger bigger feeling uh, with my training and obviously the visual look as well today is a friday so it is kind of a half day off but we're going to go to the gym this morning and then I've got bits and bobs to do. So I'm gonna take you through a, I think it's just an upper body session with some legs and I'm gonna do some rehab as well. Then we're off to the Badea clinic again for the third time this week um, to get a light treatment, to get the ele electro electron treatment, I keep forgetting the name of that, but it's electron treatment that basically the electrode, electrodes just basically uh, create electro electrical current between the two uh, points and it just feels like you know, you're know you getting a small shock in the back of your knee which then creates this healing process hopefully. Um, I'm going to ask him today if we can aspirate the cysts at the back of my knee which means basically going in, putting in a needle into the cysts and then drawing out the fluid to see if that reduces the inflammation within the area. Hopefully he's going to be able to do that because that is my major issue at the moment in time, the, the, the inflammation within that cyst that's causing compression around the back of the knee which is causing pain so I'll do that and then um, after that we have nothing really planned we've got a new dining room table we've got new stuff outside so you know we've got a whole massive table here uh, and we've got outside stuff as well so we are we're kind of making it a lot more homely now but half the sofa still because half the sofa is still in the bedroom where I sleep so when we get that back we're gonna have a full-on uh, full house now in terms of um, places to hang out, places to do work, which is going to be awesome. And then the rest of the day, we'll see how it comes. I'll take you through some of the meals as well. I'm not going to eat. Now it's eight o'clock. So I'm going to go to the gym, come back, then eat, then go to the day clinic. So guys, let's go and uh, chat to you in the next video. So we're at the moment on the Arabica blend for the lovely coffee machine, the Sage. So we recently got this, I've been dying to get one of these for such a long period of time. So nice to have a full on fucking good coffee machine to get some good coffee in the morning. So uh, the Arabica blend, not my favourite if I'm being honest. I like it when you go to the shop and you get a latte from there, it's awesome. But we do need to find some better beans. I do enjoy more of like a less acidic blend than this a little bit more fruity and a little more bold but we'll find something and then we'll put it through and find our optimal coffee machine I know that Millie, our coffee blend I know that Millie doesn't really like it either so we're just getting through it and then finding another one and then we'll see if we can find the, the perfect coffee for the morning uh, and also I'm getting into cigars at the moment so I'm trying to find a perfect coffee blend for a cigar as well in the evening or the morning depending on what time I have the cigar uh, but very exciting to, to take you through that when we do them as well uh, I'll run you through my in the next couple of weeks we're running through my cigar collection of what I think is a good one uh, and maybe you guys can get on it too because it's something I've learned very very recently and I'm fucking enjoying it very much. Right. So 
that was legs. Uh, we're going to review the session here because I want to go through and talk through exactly why I did what I did. Uh, as it is leg day, I thought I was going to do upper body, but I changed it to legs because I thought, oh, do you know what? I'll give it a go. See if it works. And it did. So, first up, we got uh, the seated uh, calf machine. So, for this one, there's a lot of dominance within my left calf, obviously, because my one has been working all of the time. As you can see here, I'm leaning back slightly to take less leverage onto the knee, and I'm also going up on my toes. I mean, the video is, we'll, we'll zoom in a little bit, um, on the, the left and right leg. You'll see that I'm not coming down all of the way to create the stretch, because with the, uh, the calf tear, the more lengthening, the more stretching that you do of that area, the more risk of tearing again. So I'm coming down to just about 90 degrees, then coming back up, spending a lot of time in that contracted period because that's where I need to strengthen it. I need to get as high as I can in plantar flexion, contract the calf as much as possible to create that adaptation that I need to from a strength perspective, from a muscle perspective. But also, uh, calf, the calf muscle has a lot of role within uh, knee flexion. So if I'm going on to doing squats, I'm going on to do other exercises, it is going to help massively in the ability to, to support the joint during that time period. The, the calf and the hamstring have this co-contraction, so basically the calf goes over the knee joint and then the hamstring goes over the knee joint that way. So the stability of those two joints and uh, over the joint and the two muscles are really, really important. So if this one works really well and this one works really well, then you get a good synergistic effect of the joint being stable. If one of them is compromised, which mine is, I need to work a lot harder on stabilizing that joint, getting the contractions in like, of the calf before we then move on to the hack squat or anything else going forward. So that's the calf. From the calf, I moved on to the hack squat. So this is the first time I've done the hack squat. Um, you will see it's not much load at all. I've opted for a lower stance because with that lower stance, I can get a little bit more quads than I would do. I'm not really worried about going full range of motion down because it's not about that. It's not about getting my hip flexion in place. It's about stimulating the quads as best as possible. So you can see here, I'm going down slowly and I'm not getting to full extension because my leg extension in terms of full straight is really, really difficult at the moment. I'm still struggling with that range of motion, which uh, is something to work on over time, but I don't want to go all the way up, irritate it and get that from it. So I'm just trying to operate in that lower range of motion and you know, stimulate, hold at the bottom and and come back up so it's a it's a good little exercise uh, and uh, it definitely definitely worked the quads for sure what I do find and with any injury you do dominate on the other side so you do try and put a lot more weight through the non-injured side so for this one I really really tried at the bottom to put a lot more weight through my right side and then push all the way through after that as you'll see, I moved on to quad, quad leg extensions and you can see the blooming shaking that's going on with these legs uh, every single time I'm trying to get to the top as I'm getting to the top and I'm thinking about really pushing through my shins as opposed to anything else because the foot will move and wobble but the, the, the quads don't attach onto the foot so where that, wherever that position is it doesn't really matter so I'm thinking about pushing through my shins and you'll see the massive difference between the atrophy of the right leg and the left leg my left leg is much much bigger uh, than my left and you'll see the shaking which obviously means that it's kind of it's weak as well so as I was getting to the top, I was doing reps in which I would go both up with both legs and then on the right hand side, I would take more weight through that right side on the way down. So basically eccentric loading. With eccentric loading, you can get a lot more strength over the course of your, uh, your movement. Generally, typically know that on an eccentric portion, you can take at least 1.5 times the weight that you can lift when you do concentric work. So the kicking out can be weaker than as you lower down. We can eccentrically load a lot better. So I was working and capitalizing on that, which is really, really important. Then, which I didn't get on the video, I did some leg curls for the first time uh, and they didn't work out at all well. Uh, the load that goes, it was a lying leg curl, so it just doesn't work. And what I realized was, is that the reason why the leg curl, both seated and uh, lying, didn't work for me is because I'm just, my hamstrings are super weak. Like in that position, I'm curling in both ways. The legs are just already fatigued too much to, to what they can capably do. So I had to really strip it back and did some standing, no weighted leg curls to really contract the hamstring in the shortened position which really worked well i'm not going to full extension either on the way down because that will create uh that 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 quad that leg extension position where my 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 sister at the back of my leg is catching so i did like half repetition uh leg curls and that was my session just a small and short and sweet session plenty of rest in between um but overall you know i can feel the quads working i feel the calf it really quite stimulated now so it's fucking awesome so it's time for some breakfast and then it is off to the bidet clinic
next morning, uh, what happened was I went to go to the Bidea clinic. Uh, Millie wanted to vlog, so she got to uh, she got to use the camera. Uh, and uh, basically, from the Bidea clinic, it was one of those sessions in which they tried something new. The um, we couldn't aspirate the cyst because when we looked under the ultrasound um, and when you look underneath, there generally looks like a pocket of like air effectively within the tissue. There wasn't that there, which meant that there wasn't a cyst there that they could see. And then what he explained to me is like the back of the knee, from an orthopedic surgeon perspective, the back of the knee is one of those places that you want, you, he said, you basically sign in a death wish if you get it wrong by an inch or a centimetre. So then he explained to me how the back of the knee is like one of the most innovative places for arteries, nerves, venous returns, muscle tissue attachment, and basically all of the shit that could go wrong, it could do. So going into there and pulling out stuff and doing stuff at his clinic uh, under like non-operative procedure would not be a good idea. So anyway, he looked for one just to see if he could, like if it was superficial, maybe he could do it there. But it turns out there wasn't, and it was, um, there is no, thing in the way of where my pain is directly which is annoying because normally you want something to kind of say yeah this is why I've got pain, this is why it sucks, this is why I fucking shit but uh, it doesn't seem to be that way so what he did do instead was took a large needle full of like lidocaine which is pain relief, some inflammatory stuff, it's sort of the same stuff I had injected into my calf a week ago but he put that behind the back of the knee and uh, on one of the ones where he, he pinned it in the back of my knee he literally nicked a nerve and basically my foot like contracted. I felt all of the nerves of my foot just got fucking wild and then basically dead. And then basically after that, I had a dead foot for about fucking two hours. So it was, it was weird. Um, anyway, I finished that, I came home, feeling pretty despondent and feeling shit really. Like it's the next day now and I still feel gash because there just doesn't seem to be an answer for that particular thing. Like I did legs yesterday, as I showed you and it felt good, it felt like there's progress, but then again, I didn't sleep again last night because of the pain. Uh, I fucking slept on the balcony for one and a half hours in the middle of the night, okay, opened like 12 or one, came in for you know another hour and a half, couldn't get to sleep, slept on the sofa again. I'm back around in this fucking cycle of always just like not getting sleep and like I'm trying to run a business and a half and stuff is just exhausting in itself, let alone without getting sleep. So. It's a struggle and Saturday is a busy day. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what the process is for next, next go rehab, like going rehab forwards. Although I just need to take the facts. Like the facts are that my knee is still recovering and still in the process of healing. My scar isn't fully healed. I can feel it stretched sometimes, which means that it's definitely not healed. Um, I know that my hamstrings are not working. I know that my quads are still super weak and I can't get to leg extension, like straight leg. I know that my calves are super weak. And I just have to trust my gut and know that if I get those stronger, there may be a positive that comes from that. So, you know, I'm gonna up my rehab next week. I'm gonna really go and speak to John again because he offered uh, to get some pain relief and do an IV drip from a pain relief perspective, which is new, I haven't had an IV drip before. I think just generally because of the destructive nature of like, uh, the digestive system with painkillers, uh, anti-inflammatories, they kind of remove that process by going through uh, the intravenously through your arm, putting it dripping. So I'm going to go and give that a go next week. I'm going to reach out to them today and say, can I come and get one? And they've been super accommodating, by the way. Uh, that guy literally is just like, bro, come and use our clinic, come and use everything. It's on the house. All you have to do is pay for um, little bits and bobs uh, along the way, the injections, anything that the, the nurses have to do, they, they'll pay for, you'll, you'll pay for, but any of the treatments, it's on the house, because I think he feels partly responsible, so obviously he had nothing to do with the surgery, it had nothing to do with the whole process, but when he came in, he sees that I was 29, 30 now, uh, sees that I had a knee replacement, sees that it's gonna be a long process, you know, the guy keeps telling me which I, which I love, and it's hard to hear every single time he says it, it's like, bro, in a year's time, Hopefully you're going to be in a better position. You just got to stay patient. And I'm like, bro, a year's time. I was told that I'd be running in six to seven weeks, and it's already fucking week eight. So, you know, it's a, um, it's one getting sold the dream. It's like getting sold that amazing car, and then you realise that the car probably got some fucking it had a previous crash or something like that. Which is hopefully going to be one of my next videos. Hopefully, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to get a fucking car. Um, because I really want one and when you're in an emotional state like this there's nothing better than doing one or two things eating a load of nice food spending money 
I know I'm on a diet, so I can't really buy nice foods. So uh, I'm going to be spending money. Uh, so hopefully we're going to do a getting the car video at some point. Um, but that, that reminds me because the car that I went to look at, they're very, very reluctant to give me the VIN number to look at the previous history of the car, which sucks. So you're, you're looking at this beautiful thing on the outside, you think it's going to be amazing, and then next minute they're probably going to tell me it's been in four crashes, it's got a wonky fucking uh, chassis. chassis. So anyway, like it's just the expectation versus reality of this whole process. Like I'm waking up two hours sleep every night, and I've seen 90 year old women when I used to work as a work experience within a nursing home, I've seen women recover better than I have. And I know that there's some research to support that if you're 30 versus 80, the neurological impulses and responses are a lot more sensitive and exciting, which means that you know, you're, in, you're in your prime effectively for neurological enrichment, which means that it's gonna be more painful for, for younger people to get these type of really invasive surgeries. But I also think it's like half of me just doubts whether I'm just being a pussy or not. And, um, I need to get out of that mindset because it's not helping anyone. Uh, you know, it's a negative thinking pattern. Me thinking I'm fucking a pussy and I'm just in pain all the time and it's, it's my fault because I can't struggle or suffer. I think I've probably proved over the last 10 years that I, I'm a hustler and I get shit done and I, I do stuff despite being, you know, injured, sick or ill. But um, for some reason, this one just doesn't go away. It just keeps in the back of my mind that you're being a pussy, but I need to get out of that mindset. So. We'll see what happens there. Go and get some IV drips next next week. Continue on the rehab. We're bumping up to three sessions next week. So what I'm going to do is to save time. Every single time I go in for a, a training session. So one of them is today. Uh, one of them is yesterday. One of them two days before. I'm just going to tag on at the beginning of the workout the the leg extension, the leg workout, so that I can then move on to the upper body stuff. I don't want to spend any more time in the gym than I need to. Especially when I'm actually, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this on a previous vlog, but I've actually like condensed my workload massively. So I don't start work on most days till 12. So I do more like a, a 12 till about 8, 9 shift, um, which is great to be in that position from a business perspective. And I'm relying heavily on my like guys, Declan, him, Tom, Ashley, Lissetti, um, to really help me do this. Um, and it's a pleasure to see those guys really step up and I'm so, so grateful for them. Uh, so I've been able to pull down the workload massively, which means that my morning time is more relaxation. It's more about me chilling out and probably recovering from not getting enough sleep. So, you know, I'll go to bed at like whatever, 9, 10, I'll wake up at 1, go back to bed at 2, get like two more hours, then get, get up again for half an hour, then go back to bed for two hours, then Millie gets up, then I'll get up, and then I'll chill out, go to, get a coffee, go to the gym, come back, wipe out again, and then basically then might go to the bidet clinic and then might start work. So it's, um, it's a graft. If I would have had this knee surgery a year ago, my business would have failed because it was all heavily reliant on me. And maybe you know, these opportunities, these times are made, made to make me feel grateful. And I have to feel grateful for the team that I've built, for what I've built and the people that have been around me. Everyone's been amazing. Mills has been great. Jake, Adam, Sandy, Molly. All the doctors have been absolutely fantastic. Mum and dad have not been over here, but like they've been obviously super, super supportive. The team have been really, really supportive. And I'm super, super grateful to be in this position. If I would have been in that one bedroom flat a year ago that I started vlogging from, I'd have fucking jumped out the window, I reckon, 100%, because that was a deep, deep, deep. That would have been deep, being on my own in Dubai, you know, not with Millie at the time, you know, struggling through this, it would have been, and heavily relying on myself to do, you know, 16 hour days. I think that's the role of an entrepreneur as well, right? Like you get through this peak, and I always speak about this within the business, uh, business coaching business that I work from, uh, with like Millie and some other people, is that there's this peak in business where it's all you, it's all you, it's all you, and the more you effort you put in, the more rewards you get, and then the more effort you put in, the more reward, the more reward, and then you get to a point where when you start leveraging out and things, people start working in your business, you actually do less work, but like the financial income still creeps upwards and you do less work over time when more people take responsibility. I'm so glad that I was in that position before I got this done because this last year would have been a nightmare. So what am I going to do now that I've had no sleep and I need to get four days work done? So tackling sleep and tackling like basically sleep deprivation at the same time as trying to be a highly productive person is a absolute fuckery. It's just really difficult. So the Three big tips that I can give you right now if you're fucking struggling with sleep, if you're a business person, if you're corporate, you've got kids and you're getting up and through the night, 
what I've been doing is one is reducing the expectations that you have on yourself each day. So my gyms got cut down to three sessions, my workload got cut down massively. If you're a business owner, you can do that. If you're in the same position I am, but it's not just heavily reliant on you, you can do that. And even if you're on your own, you can do that to two, to a degree. So don't put that pressure on yourself that you have to always perform high, because at the end of the day, there will be peaks and troughs throughout the year that you can kind of say, I'm gonna hold for now and then push later when I'm feeling better. If you're just a normal person that works in a corporate job, it'll be more regulating your weekends, mornings and evenings to manage for you. And after you've took away some work or some expectations, the key will be to, you know, utilize the normal benefits of water intake, coffee intake, you know, food intake. If you're eating like shit when you're feeling like shit and you're sleeping like shit, you'll feel worse. You know, when I started the rehab process, I appetite was so low that I was eating probably cereal and whey protein twice a day and maybe a fucking chicken butty. <laughs> that was literally my diet. And then now, you know, I'm in a position where I'm getting less sleep than I did before. I'm probably equally in pain, a little bit less uh, now than I was before. But I'm having more nutritious meals. I'm getting the cream of rice with the protein in, I'm getting the egg white omelet, I'm getting the veggies, I'm getting the chicken salads, I'm getting the the, the cereal and my protein, obviously still frozen fruit if I need to. So you're, you're feeding yourself and fueling yourself, like sure, have I wanted to go and fucking eat loads of shit at 2am in the morning when I'm waking up and feeling depressed? Yeah, because I know there's a fucking bag of M&Ms down the bottom of there where Adam and Sandy bought it to me as a present for the rehab process. I know there's a fucking bag of M&Ms in there, but is isn't going to make me feel any better in the long term and actually just feeds into that perpetual cycle. So feed yourself, fuel yourself for, for the place that you want to be, not where you feel right now, is that's going to be key. And the last one is figure out a way to get more sleep. Solve the problem at hand. A lot of people won't have the same problem that I have with the rehabilitation process and the knee replacement. They'll just have either shit sleeping habits, they'll have you know, unhealthy habits around what time they're talking to their missus at 1 a.m. in the morning or they're going to watch Netflix until 2 a.m. or they're getting up at 4 a.m. to, you know, or they're getting in at 4 a.m. to do whatever. And they will be self-inflicted variations. If they're self-inflicted variations, that's when you need to have a little bit of a look at yourself and go, I'm putting myself in this hole. And if I'm putting myself in a hole, I even need to just make some changes so that I don't feel shit. So, you know, watching Netflix till half eleven instead of one. You know, making sure that you don't go boozing every single night to get that sleep deprivation. And low sleep and sleep deprivation have the same side effects. So you could stay up all the way through the night, or you could get uninterrupted sleep for a few hours. They give you the same uh, effects. Hunger will be higher. Cognitive function will be lower. Digestion will be slower. Water retention. Uh, you'll feel like shit, your energy levels will be low. They all come from the same thing. So fixing sleep is really, really important. You want around seven to eight hours per night, or if you're getting technical, like sleep cycles wise, you need six, seven sleep cycles, or I think seven, don't quote me on that one, but it's enough sleep cycle, 90 minutes times, you know, whatever, five or six or seven, I don't, my brain's not working today. It's in that range yet. Yeah. Once you get those, you'll feel a hell of a lot better. It's the most, recoverable your body can be in an in its state you know sleep is that important so don't be self-inflicting those parameters on yourself by thinking that you can get away with you know going to extra sleep and here's the thing people will get away with four hours sleep or i feel fine on normal five hours sleep your normal is so feeling like shit you think it's normal <laughs> that's that's the thing if you feel like shit if you don't if you don't know what good feels like your shit will be good for you so when people say, oh, I'm fine on four hours sleep or I'm fine on five hours sleep, it's like, yeah, you're fine. That's fine, you're, you're surviving. But imagine what you could do if you actually prioritized it. Imagine what you could feel like if you did. Like, I don't, I can't remember the last time that I felt amazing because of the situation I'm in. But I tell you, when I go back to it, when I go back to eating more nutritious foods, when I go back to walking outside, when I go back to training more intensely, when I go back to having a better headspace, less of pain, that barometer of what I feel like now, I feel fine, I feel like, yeah, I'm tired, whatever, I'm, I'm moody because of my knee, but I'm fine, I can deal with it. There's a difference between dealing with it and performing well. So if you're in that cycle of thinking, oh, I only need five hours, my mum was in the same thing, she's drinking coffee before bed and then getting up at 5 a.m. thinking, oh yeah, you oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And it's no wonder, like, you just, you drive yourself into the ground. And at some point, that breaks, or at some point, you 
feel that's normal, and then now that becomes your baseline. You don't want your baseline to be shit, and just because you don't feel shit doesn't mean you aren't feeling shit, because feelings are you know, perceptual, they're fleeting, they adjust to your homeostatic level. So, you know, I feel a four out of 10, but if a four out of 10 becomes normal, four out of 10 might actually feel seven out of 10, if that even makes any sense. Whereas you don't know your limit until you actually go and uh, prioritize these things too. So I'm gonna get one more day, had a bit of pep talk from a sleep perspective now. So let's go and train, and then we're gonna go and do a full day's work. It's a gym, it's a workout this morning at the home gym. I do not want to go to the gym because my knee's fucking killing. So, quick little set. Go, get it done and dusted. This place, I'm all busy, busy, busy. Get out of my fucking gym. I'm in my own car. show see if uh, Bridgman can do it and then go from that and that's the rest of the day.